So over the last couple of weeks, we've seen a lot of new releases from watch brands, watches and wonders in Switzerland was a big reason for this. So what I wanted to do was recapping the show and me being on the ground in Switzerland for the duration of the week. We'll start with looking at some of my favorites, some other ones that I was like pretty cool to see, maybe not as much for me. And then it's a close at the end, some of the more controversial releases from the show. And the whole point of this is not to go through every single watch release from the show, just some of the highlights and potential lowlights. We'll talk about all of that. But if you do want some deep dives on some of the different brands, I'll have a link to many different articles that we released during the show, new Rolex releases, Tudor, Grand Seiko, IWC Ingenieur, Patek Philippe. All of that will be in the description down below if you wanna get lost and see some more detailed coverage of those brands. And we also have many videos on this channel. Apart from the watches released at the show, there were some other brands that were releasing some great things. One I'll call attention to available on teddybaldeser.com is the new Nomos Club Campus Collection. Two new dial colors. We have the electric green version and the coral dial color. These are some of the best positioned everyday style watches in the market at large without question. $1,500 in-house manual wound caliber on the inside with the alpha manual. 100 meters of water resistance just checks off the boxes across the board. Love these designs, just came out. Links will be in the description down below. And then also a new Tissot PRX chronograph. We saw the two original models from last year. They're now extending beyond that with this new Panda dial format. With this one also coming with the shade of blue, it's not black, don't be mistaken. The dial color has this nice line finish to it as well. Love this color combination. Probably, again, my favorite so far. Link will be in the description as well, both available on teddybaldasar.com. So to begin here, let's go through some of my favorite watches that I saw at the show. We'll begin with one of the standouts and that is from JLC with the Reverso Tribute Chronograph. This was simply a phenomenal watch. Uh, this is not the first time we've seen a chronograph in a reverso case, but it has been some time and I think this is very well executed at that. On the inside, you have the manual JLC 860, horizontal clutch, as well as column wheel. And a couple of my favorite features about this watch, apart from the movement, how this thing looks, you have the traditional tribute style dial on one side, so very low key, and then it's all business on the back. Pushers are very close into the case, not going to extend out any further. And one of the reasons why I really love this integration of a chronograph within the Reverso case is they did not lose the plot in deviating too far of what a reverso should be, in my opinion, which is just understated class. And this one is 100% exactly that. The case itself is 11.14 millimeters thick, and that is including the chassis that carries the central case that will flip around and show that beautiful movement if you are wanting to see that chronograph in action. Another cool indication on this is going to be the 30 minute counter at the bottom. Once it reaches 30 minutes, it'll snap back to the zero. One of my favorites from the show. And apologies if I sound a little bit more nasally I am trying to overcome a cold here. I got it on the way traveling back from Switzerland, but I did want to still talk about this. So I hope you'll bear with me here. Moving right along, we have the Tudor Black Bay collection. And now many people were talking about the Tudor Black Bay 54. And for good reason, it's a new case for Tudor. It's something that nobody was asking for, but now that it's here, many are excited about it, including myself. But what I want to actually talk about is probably the unsung hero from the new Tudor releases this year. And that is with the new Tudor Black Bay collection, the non-diver variants, 31, 36, 39, and 41. The reason being is because this was a glaring hole within Tudor's collection. If there was the obvious thing to do next, I think the two obvious points for them they needed to address, one is extending the Pelagos line, which we'll have to wait a little bit longer to see that. But the other area that made a ton of sense for them to revisit is looking at these traditional three-hand everyday style Black Bay models. Last year, we saw the s &G models getting the updates with the MT calibers on the inside. This year, we're seeing the same thing, shifting into MT calibers, COSC certified, 70 hour power reserve, T-fit clasp as well in these watches. So there is a lot to like. The crown design is completely changed, looks much more refined than the previous iteration. And you are also getting a wide flexibility of different dial colors now. I love the new blue dial color. I think it is maybe even better than the previous one. It's different than any other blue that I've seen them utilize in any other black bay. So I think it's great. 100 meters of water resistance just checks off the boxes. The prices have started to just gradually creep up with these. So you are getting closer to a traditional black bay diver with the prices here. But if you are someone that just wants a do it all watch for the money, 
these are leaders. This is probably going to infringe on some of the territory that has been established by the Tudor Ranger in terms of that everyday do-it-all style watch from Tudor. But one of the unsung heroes from the show from Tudor, and after I had some time to reflect on what I saw, might be my favorite from the brand in general from the show. That said, I am interested to do a review on this as well as the new 54. Now last year and this year, maybe my favorite watch from both of the shows came from a brand you would not expect, and that is Parmigiani Fleurier. The watches that they've been releasing as of late within the Tonda PF collection, I think are fantastic. I have a kind of a watch crush on Parmigiani Fleurier. I think they're doing an amazing job in terms of redefining what this brand represents and doing some cool things in the process. And this Parmigiani uh, Tonda PF Minute Retropunt is an extension of one of my favorite watches from last year, and that was their GMT Retropunt. So if you're not familiar with this, you're essentially getting a refined steel sports oriented dress hybrid style watch 40 millimeter case, micro rotor movement on the inside, wears like a dream on the wrist, will slide underneath the dress cuff given its thickness being under 11 millimeters. But why this watch is so cool is it is building off of what we saw last year with the GMT. This has now taken that idea of the GMT from last year and now integrated it in with a minute timer, an elapsed timer for the watch. How it's doing this is by way of an additional hand. If you're looking at it from the resting position, you only have two hands, but that's where the magic comes into play. On the side of the case, you have two different pushers. One will adjust the minute hand that is hidden underneath the other minute hand in one minute. The other one will adjust it in five minute increments. So you can set the precise time that you want to time. And then as that time goes by, you'll then see the two hands, the minute hands come in unison with one another to indicate how much time has passed. And then when you're done timing, you can just press the pusher on the crown and it will snap back into place in that hidden position. Pretty quirky, but I absolutely love it. One of my favorites from the show, might be my favorite watch from the show that I was able to see. Love what this brand is doing. I am a huge Parmigiani Fleurier fan. Another less talked about release from the show that I was a fan of is going to be the Zenith Pilot Collection. Pretty much everything that they release, I was a fan of from the Pilot series. Uh, these are watches that I think are well positioned. They also lean into Zenith's history with Pilot watches, which I was uh, aware of, but not to the extent that I thought I was when I learned a little bit more. Uh, the brand actually trademarked the word Pilot in the 1800s before anyone really took flight. So that's having some foresight and knowing where things are going. Over the past few years, you've seen some redirection with some of their products uh, with new leadership. And I think they've been doing a nice job. This is one of my favorite implementations of new direction I've seen from them with this new pilot series. With the three hand models, you're talking about a 40 millimeter case, wears compact on the wrist, uh, but still very legible with its contrast. You have a ceramic option, a steel option with an El Primero caliber on the inside. So high beat movement. And then you're also getting some new chronographs. I was more of a fan of the three hand models just because of their price and positioning, but the chronographs are also exceptional. Flyback chronographs and the date wheel and how it just feels when you, this is something where you're getting really nerdy into the weeds, but this was something when I was holding these watches in hand, I just adored the way that the date wheel just adjusted. It was so snappy and responsive with its feedback. It was satisfying as can be. Now, Grand Seiko had a huge year last year at Watches and Wonders where they were unveiling their Kodo Constant Force Tourbillon. This year, they had some other releases that were still very good. My favorite was the Lake Sua edition, the SLGA019. This is falling in the direction of the new series of calibers from the Spring Drive collection with the 9RA2. This was unveiled in the last couple of years. This movement is a newer movement, extended power reserve, 120 hours, and a tighter range of deviation of accepted accuracy, plus or minus 10 seconds per month. If you're familiar with a traditional spring drive like the 9R65, that's plus or minus 15 seconds per month. So they're extending out that power reserve while making it more accurate. The dial is inspired by Lake Sua, which is a lake in Japan, which is near their studio where they're doing much of their watchmaking work. And if you actually look up a photo of Lake Sua, you'll see that they actually did a pretty good job. Uh, of course, Grand Seiko always inspiring things from nature, but hey, they do a good job when they do it. Wearable case, 40 millimeters, 47.9 millimeter lug to lug, and 11.8 millimeters thick, 100 meters of water resistance. Just a good watch top to bottom in terms of its fit finish. Uh, and then also its dial, I think is quite well done. Cartier had a very solid show across the board, but my favorite was the Santos de Cartier. I'm a huge fan of this collection. I've loved this collection, uh, specifically the medium case, because it just feels so refined and true to the original ethos of what Cartier represents to me, which is that understated elegance and just almost carefree elegance that's like not even trying, but it just is. 
That's what I love about these watches. Here they unveiled a new green dial version and a blue dial version. I love the green, looks beautiful, striking, on wrist, I could show some wrist shots. It just snap, I mean, it just pops. It just pops off the wrist, it feels right, wore like a glove on me. This is more my own personal opinion. Some people, I think we're looking at some of the other models from them, but this is what you know, resonated with me. And I also think from a price positioning standpoint, makes a lot of sense. And then another favorite of mine, and I didn't get to spend as much time with this watch. I really just saw it in the window, uh, unfortunately. I'd love to be able to spend some more time with it, but the Tag Heuer Carrera, 39 millimeters. Now Tag is a mixed bag at times. They sometimes can get out of their own way when it comes to giving uh, lovers of the brand what they ultimately want. But this is an answer right on the money that I think is in the wheelhouse of showing that Tag is still has some great opportunity in front of them if they can just refine their product and really get these winners within their collection. 39 millimeter case Carrera, movement on the inside that has been updated to a degree, 80 hour power reserve, four hertz movement, 14.2 millimeters thick. The blue dial looks spectacular. I, I think they knocked this out of the park. I mean, what a, unexpected model for me from Tag Heuer, but I wanted to give them props because this is a phenomenal release from them and it's positioned in a range that, yes, you're getting close to a Speedmaster. Yes, you're a little bit above a Tudor Black Bay chronograph and right below some Breitlings, but it's in a realm that I think it can be competitive. It has its own design DNA. The Carrera is one of the most important chronographs ever produced. And from a design standpoint, this is a beautiful looking watch. I think they did a phenomenal job here. Now we're gonna move on to some nice to see watches. I mean, these were watches that maybe are not necessarily for me, but they were cool and I wanna give them a shout out. So watches that uh, didn't get my heart pumping the, you know, as crazy as some of the ones I just mentioned, but uh, definitely some nice watches to consider and were interesting talking points throughout the show. One was with the new Hermes H08 chronograph. This is a mono pusher chronograph from Hermes. I, I stopped by their booth, I got some shots, and I really like what the H08 represents. It's a cool design. It's their own design, which when most fashion oriented brands start to create watches, how can I say this? They make watches in a pretty crude way. They're not thought through fully. They're usually just rehashing a lot of established ideas, but that is not the case with Hermes. You could actually argue they have some of the most fresh design in all of watches in terms of their dials and typography. Typography especially, like look at the eight, look at the four. Have you ever seen anything like that? Because I haven't. They, that is their own style and what they're going for. So. Props to them. Titanium bezel and Voche manufactured caliber on the inside. So they have an acquired piece of ownership of Voche, I think from my understanding, but produce phenomenal movements. And a mono pusher from Hermes was just not something I expected, but I wanna give them a cool shout. I think they did a nice job here. So I think the best release from Rolex was probably the Titanium Yacht Master for most people. That's more in line with what they typically do. Uh, maybe not titanium, but sports watches and delivering there. But I wanna talk about the Rolex 1908. When we saw some of the teasing out from Rolex, there was this shot of the Cellini style bezel. And everyone's like, okay, yeah, the Cellini's gonna get an update. But we actually got something instead of that. And that is the Rolex 1908, a totally new collection, 39 millimeter case, new caliber on the inside, the 7140 that we can actually see when we flip this watch around. This is essentially replacing the Cellini and I don't know who the market is for this watch I, I, in, in a way, but I want to talk about it and I think major kudos for Rolex for actually doing something in this realm. You're talking about like a $20,000 watch and yes, you're competing with the Longa Saxonias of the world now and the Vacheron Traditionals, which I think, I mean, if I'm gonna spend my money, that's where I'm going. But uh, Rolex seems to put together a nice package here across the board and uh, I think delivering something that is different. And they do have a large enough collector base where this is going to be something that might have some legs. They've tried these type of watches in the past with the Cellini and they haven't taken off. Can this be the one that finally gets over the hump? The movement looks nice, it's on display, they're leaning into that. I think that's something that a consumer that is looking at a watch like this will value. I think they did a nice job with the hands and allowing it to be its own thing. The faceted applied hour markers look nice. I, again, don't know who exactly this is in a market for, but I'm glad it exists and I'm glad Rolex is entertaining this part of their collection. So at Watches and Wonders, there's a lot of the elevated luxury type of conversation that's just not approachable. You go by some of these booths, 
talk to some people and it you just don't feel welcome. One place where that was not the case was Oris. You go into their booth and you just get this idea. And a lot of that is stemming around their flagship release from the show, and that is the ProPilot X Kermit. Yes, Kermit, not with the Rolex Kermit, something very different, the actual Kermit from Muppets. Yes, you heard that right. How this all works, and I think it's pretty fun how they integrated it. I'm not a big fan of the overly branded type of like cartoon style stuff. I mean, but it, when it's done right, like the Silver Snoopy makes sense. NASA connection, there's real history there. Or something like this, where it's more of a subtle little thing in the details rather than just on full display all the time. How they did this was they took the date wheel, they added Kermit to be this first day of every single month. I think it's fun. I think it's a great integration of something that is pretty carefree. It's not taking itself too serious and it's approachable. And the watch itself is well done. I think the ProPilot X is one of the best watches that Oris makes. It titanium case, the bracelet is, from a finishing standpoint is phenomenal. It feels more substantial than it is, despite it being light, lighter weight. Uh, that is one thing you have to consider. Some people always orient better quality with weight. This is a titanium case. It's well finished. I love the clasp, the seatbelt operation. It's very on point, 100 meters of water resistance. Wearable case at that too, 39 millimeters by 46.9 millimeter lug to lug. Some legibility issues, but I'm glad this watch exists. It's been getting a lot of buzz as of late and a really bold move by Oris to make this happen. Nobody was asking for a watch with a cartoon frog on it, but we got it and I don't think anybody's mad. I know I certainly am not. A couple watches I also just wanna give a quick shout to as being some cool pieces. UN Freak, return back to 2001. Unique display of time, silicon component. They were revolutionizing uh, much of the development around what a watch should be from a parts standpoint, how a watch can look. This is one of the most important watches of the 21st century. I know it's a bold take, but them returning back to that original form, I think was important. Also, I'm gonna mention the Chopard LUC 1860. This is a watch I didn't spend as much time with at the show, but everything I've seen, micro rotor, 22 karat gold micro rotor, a Geneva seal movements, ESA dial, uh, tribute to that 1997 model. It is uh, absolutely a spectacular looking watch. And I think they did a wonderful job. You stack this up against some other watches in the tier. Sure, many people are not thinking Chopard, but their LUC movements, I mean, it is, it is top shelf stuff. And the one final watch I think was just really remarkable to see in person, and that is with Langa's Odysseus Chronograph. This is a watch, if you just, you know, see it in person, it is just a marvel to look at. It, you look at the finishing of the watch from top to bottom, stunning new chronograph caliber on the inside, how the pushers are so unique and stealthy with how they approach. The pushers act as normal chronograph pushers at certain moments. If you adjust the crown, then adjust the date. So you have that multi-functionality with the pushers. It's brilliant. It's very, very smart how the hands will reset for the chronograph uh, and spin in a certain direction on the reset. It's fun to get lost in. If you want more details on that, they actually, I think, released a pretty in-depth video explaining how all this works. Now, to release one watch at the show, $120,000 for a steel watch, it is a remarkable watch, but those are some question marks I would maybe just mention. As somebody that might wanna buy a Langa, I could see them maybe being frustrated with uh, not having as much product to look at. And then in addition, you know, spending a lot of money to get this watch. Not saying it's not worth it, but it is a lot of money for a steel chronograph. But all in all, still a beautiful, beautiful watch uh, in terms of a design perspective. But now let's get into some watches I either didn't like as much or were just more controversial or just some talking points that we can discuss. The first one we have to mention is the IWC Ingenieur. This was one of the main talks of the show, both good and bad. If, if Whether you love the watch or didn't love the watch, it you had an opinion about it. That was pretty much the safe thing to say about this piece. I had some opportunity to get hands on with it. Now, let me say the good and the bad with this. Now, the, the good is, if they, I don't think they could have knocked this out of the park anymore from how this watch feels on the wrist. 40 millimeter case, 10.7 millimeters in thickness, 100 meters of water resistance. The dials and how they're finished when you look at them in person are beautiful to look at. I love the aqua dial. It has the polished center link, which was kind of an interesting point that I didn't notice until I started looking at the photos again, compared to the, the black uh, as well as the white. I put it on the wrist and I just, I, I almost fell in love. I, I thought they did such a nice job with it. But then the reason why people would have some objections with it, and I think it's fair to say, is just the price and positioning. The Ingenieur is one of those pillars of integrated sports watches. It is, it's one of those pillars of the 1970s. It has the Genta connection and 
that is, I think, an important thing that people, when looking at the hierarchy of all those integrated designs, think about. Uh, it was one of the earlier adopters of it. It had the Genta connection. It was one of his three major that he did in the 1970s of that integrated style. Uh, and that deserves its kudos. But from a pricing standpoint, you're talking about $12,000 for a stainless steel watch that has the same movement as a Mark 20. That price separation is going to have a lot of people scratching their heads, including myself. Now, have they done a nice job with the design of this piece? Yes, absolutely. I think it's probably the best ingenue that I have seen since I've been into watches. Was it smart for them to reinvigorate this whole collection? Absolutely. Is the pricing a bit of a head scratcher? Yes, it is. And I think that's the challenge with this watch. Consumers are willing to spend more money on a watch as long as you can rationalize and tell them why the cost is what it is. Uh, or, you know, with the movement being the same movement as some of their more entry level pieces, I think it's gonna be hard for them to rationalize what am I paying for here apart from maybe falling into the trend of integrated sports in a design that is absolutely beautiful. Will they still be successful with these? Probably. I think they're going to still do well at that price range, but I have to mention all of these things because this was one of the most polarizing releases of the show. Beautiful design, beautiful approach, but you do have this element of price that had a lot of people talking, including myself. Next couple of watches, I'm not gonna spend much time on these. These are just not for me, but I'm happy they exist. I think they're personally pretty ugly. I think they're ugly watches, but I like that they exist. And even if you agree with me, I think it is important that we acknowledge the fact that this is Rolex doing something different. They're the brand that always just does the expected. This was not expected. Rolex put emojis on a watch. Yes, let me repeat that again. Emoji, yes, those emojis. They put emojis on a watch. Do I think it's tasteful? Do I want to get one? Absolutely not. Do I think they're ugly? Yes, I do. But is it good that Rolex did this? I think so. And even if you are someone that agrees with me on this, I can say I, not, I don't like something, but at the same time, I can be okay with the fact that it exists because there's a customer for it. And if that's gonna get more people in the watches, I think that's the right attitude to have. Uh, not for me, I'm not gonna be lining up and calling any authorized dealer to try to get these watches by any means. I probably wanna get them as far away from me as possible, but still, a lot of fun and kudos to Rolex for doing it. Next, we have Panerai with their Quaranta. This is their 40 millimeter case. I love the way that this watch works. And the reason why I'm putting it on this part where it's a bit more polarizing, I had some things to say, is mostly because of the fact that I like this way more than I thought I would. This wears like a dream on my wrist. The only puzzling thing for me with Panerai at times is how they see the smaller cases, which I understand they have the history, 45 millimeters, 47 millimeters, that's their brand DNA. But when they decide to go for the smaller case sizes, they sometimes will pull away some of the other fundamental characteristics that make the watch a Panerai. You have this dive watch history, the Italian Navy, and then you have a 50 meter water resistance watch. Now there is a video online of testing out some of these watches that go far beyond that tested standard. And you know, Panerai is basically just being very conservative about the water resistance of these watches, which is true. I know that these watches would go far beyond that and be more than what you would need. But still, it's worth mentioning. I think just in general, I, when I was looking at these watches, Panerai had a really good show, in my opinion. I thought uh, the annual calendar, the different piece, the California dial that they released across the board, I thought they did a nice job. Uh, but when seeing these, the Quaranta in person, I'm like, oh, I actually love how these wear. Just don't suck the soul of what a Panerai watch is, even though you are deviating to a different direction. Just because somebody wants a smaller size doesn't mean they don't want the characteristics of what makes a Panerai a Panerai. And then I'll also just mention Tag Heuer at the end here. Tag Heuer was very, again, a mixed bag in terms of the releases, uh, the Tag Heuer Aqua Racer 18 karat. I don't even know who this watch is really for. Uh, strange positioning for an entry level dive watch from the brand, but just seems like a lot to ask for $18,000 a gold uh, Aqua Racer, not to say that a gold watch at $18,000 is absurd. That's right in line. It just does seem strange how, you know, Tag just looks at different product categories and it almost seems like they just try to get people riled up at times. Uh, I don't have any necessarily problems with it. I'm fine that it exists, but uh, why this is a priority versus doing more of the Carrera stuff, right? Just more of that new chronograph and you know what I think most people want from Tag. And there are people that are ready to jump on the bag, uh, bandwagon for Tag Heuer if they just keep you know giving us what many people are desiring. 
Uh, but this is probably not one that I think most people are looking for. But all right, guys, those are some of the highlights, lowlights, things to just kind of talk about and got me thinking uh, after going through Watches and Wonders. Uh, so if you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe, hit the bell icon, really would appreciate that. In addition though, if you were able to stay up to date with all the new releases, what were some of your favorite picks? If you had to pick like your top three watches from the last couple of weeks, and then maybe some of your least favorite watches from the show, uh, leave some comments down below. Love to see those uh, so other people can kind of join in the conversation. Also definitely check out teddybaldasar.com, full authorized dealer of 30 brands, quick and fast fulfillment, dedicated customer support, and a full factory warranty for all the products that we offer. Any purchase on our website, website also funds the content like you see here going to Switzerland, which that costs a lot of money. We're going there and paying our way over. So if you want to support the content, allow us to keep covering uh, the different models in the industry, bringing you guys insight. Uh, any purchase helps support those efforts and bringing more content to you. But guys, thank you again so much for watching. Be well, and I will see you all very soon.